off in the chair. Okay. Open the third day. Um, this is the last day of class. Take up the bulk of our time um, just for the sake that this section is longer, and um, we'll be doing the upper bowl functions right after this. Okay, so to start us off here, this is our graph of sine x, right? And um, as our title you know, tells us, and what the whole chapter is telling us. We're interested in inverse as a function and working with them, um, applying them in some way, shape, or form. Um, can we find derivatives for them? Can we, you know, how do they work? What's their function? Um, and so when it comes to the trig functions, we also want to find inverses for these, right? So um, I guess what is the first obstacle here to, to get an inverse for this function? What is there an issue? With sign. It's not yeah, it's not one to one, right? One of the things we, we want with inverse to find an inverse function is we need the, our function itself to be one to one, right? Because let's think about this. Let's think about what's going to happen if I take my graph. I'm going to draw a y equals x line, right? Because if I find an inverse, it's just flipping over the y equals x line, right? But when I do that, I get something that looks like this, right? So this is the such, you know, this could be the inverse of sine, but clearly this is not a function, right? This is this is really bad because there's several values, right? That for each x value, there's several y's that, that go with it, right? So as it is, um, this is a problem. So what do we do, right? Well, we've talked about this before when we were talking about x squared, um, talking about you know square root of x and square root of people. We can take our domain and we can restrict it, right? And that's exactly what we're going to do in this case. But we're going to do it for sine, right? Now, can anyone tell me sine of x and cosine of x um, as well? Are stuck between two values. What are those two values? Only be the, the greatest it can be is one. Yeah. Oh. Hey, good. The sign does not go above one and does not go below negative one. It's always in between these two values, right? So if I want to represent, you know, an inverse for sign, ideally, I want to I want the inverse to be able to cover all of this ground, right? I want to you know, still be able to, to see the highest of sine, the lowest of sine, um, to be able to plug that into the function, but not obviously where it's still a function. And the way to do that, or the way that we traditionally do this is, right, let's remember what is the sign I ever do? It's one, okay. That's a good point. It's 90 degrees, right? That's that's kind of our left end, and that's gonna be that's gonna be somewhere around there, right? So that gives us that's one right there at pi over two, right? Now we could go this way, right? See, oh, one's negative, but it's it might be nicer if we could keep the zero point in here. So maybe let's look at negative pi over two. What is the sign of negative pi over two? Negative one. Good. Yep. If we remember, anytime I'm having the sign of a negative angle, this is the same thing as negative sine of that angle, right? All right. Also, it's what do we call what do we call this type of function that where if I plug in negative x, like it's negative x. We call it an odd. Good. So that is so sine is an example of an odd. Which means that 
I can take my, my graph, rotate 180 degrees around, and I get the same graph. Okay, good. So from pi over 2 to negative pi over 2, or from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2, right? I get negative 1 and I get 1, and I kind of get everything in between, right? So this is a good representation of really like every value that sine can produce, right? So I'm just going to take this little piece of sine and I'm going to cut off everything else, right? So now let's ask the question, right? Maybe I'll use a different color just to highlight this so you can see it. So here's the portion we have left. Is this a one-to-one -one function now? Good, right. It, since I cut off the left and the right sides, right, it doesn't go back down and up again. I only have this one piece. Now what that means, and maybe I'll mark some points on here so I can know where to cut off for this graph, that my inverse is well defined. And so we get this little purple graph right here, right? This graph is represented by the function y equals psi inverse of x. So there's that little negative one again. Remember, this is not the same thing as, as this, right? Do not, do not confuse the two. I'm not just looking it down. This means the inverse of sine. Um, to avoid the confusion, oftentimes people will, will also write this as something called arc sine of x, which I typically prefer to write, um, but we do need to show both. But this is the inverse function that we're looking for. Okay? Now, this inverse function only has a particular range of values, right? Because I can't just plug anything I want into that. Right, I don't. Right, it, it starts here and it stops over here. Right, so I only have a limited number of options. Right, so let's talk about those options. Right, when it comes to sine inverse of x, right. Remember, and maybe it'll be useful to write this down. So since so anytime we've seen this several times now, if I have y equals the sine inverse of x, this is the same thing as saying sine of y is equal to x, right? This is our same like inverse definition where I say y equals f inverse of x is the same thing as f inverse or f of y equals x, right? So these are how these two functions are related, okay? So let's remember as well. So what is the domain of sine in general? Yeah, so it can be anything, right? Um, what is our domain here in particular? Right, what's the leftmost angle? What's the rightmost angle? I would have you look at it. Good. Do we include those? Good. So we're going to include those because those are those give us the one values we need, right? Um, actually, maybe I'll make this one. Okay. And we already talked about the range of sine is negative one to one. Okay, good. So who can tell me what the domain of sine inverse is going to be? Negative one to one, good. Right? Remember, the domain of the inverse is the range of the original function. So the domain of sine inverse is negative one to one. Okay, so what is the range of sine inverse? So this is very important. This is very important to consider, right? When, whenever we were dealing with you know, just our trick functions and stuff. Oftentimes, if we were solving equations, we would say, okay, well, I have, um, you know, if I want when sine is equal to zero, right? I could, it could be zero, but it could be pi, two pi, it could be, so you would have like 
pi in or some sort of just your answer, right? And you would have to have every multiple two pi to make this work out. But whenever I'm dealing with equations that involve side inverse, I don't have all those options, right? I can't, right? Because anything like three pi over two, five pi over two, two pi, pi even is outside of that range, okay? So this is gonna be something to really be careful about, especially when we're defining um, kind of our composition relationship, which what I mean by that is, remember we have this, F inverse of f of x equals x, and f of f inverse of x equals x. Okay? We have the same thing here in these cases, and you might have some problems where you're going to work with this a little bit, but you need to be very careful. So let me write these down. The sine inverse of the sine of x is going to be equal to x, but only for x that is in between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. Okay? So let's let's talk about this real fast. So let me just do like a maybe a quick example of this idea. Okay. To demonstrate why this is why it's important that we have this restraint. Okay. So let's talk about sine inverse of sine of, let's see, let's see, so actually, we'll keep it up. Okay, let's take sine inverse of the sine of 2 pi. So if we were to just take this equation, and just say, okay, well, it's just going to cancel each other, so it's going to work. We're going to have an issue, right? Because is 2 pi over 3 within the given range of sine inverse? Yes, no, maybe so. It is not, right? And remember, so pi over 2 is the same thing as how many degrees? Thank you. So that's so that's just this angle here. Two pi over three. Right? What's pi over three in, in degrees? Sixty degrees, right? So I'm saying two times sixty degrees, which is one hundred twenty degrees. So that's going to be about here somewhere, right? So if I were to make the statement that sine inverse of sine of two pi over three is two pi over three, that's incorrect, right? Um, because sine inverse, as defined as we've defined it, and we're going to make it work, can't include this angle, right? Now I can still work this out, right? But it's not going to end up being two pi over three again, right? So let's so let's think about this, right? How do I figure out what's the sine of two pi over three? It's not one, not negative one either, right? That's one and negative one happen at these like pi over two angles, right? Um, or three pi over two, five pi over two, et cetera. Okay, so not not one half either. Actually, you're on the right track. Um, radical two over two. Not radical two over two. Radical two. <laughs> not radical two over three. <laughs> radical three over two. <laughs> yeah, it's it's radical three over two. Okay, so let's so again, pi over three is sixty degrees, right? So let's just uh, re quick review a trig, right? If I'm finding the value of a trig function at a specific angle, I have to ask myself, okay, what is my reference angle? Which my reference, so this is two pi over three. And so my reference angle is pi, which is 180 minus that reference angle, which is gonna be pi over three, right? And then we say, okay, well, what is the sine of pi over three? That's the same question as what is the sine of 60 degrees? Which is going to be uh, three over two. Like that. Okay, so maybe useful to go and remember those because that will need that for here. Okay. But we are at two pi over three, right? So it's going to be important to notice which quadrant we're in, 
now. This is going to be our base value, but we didn't know if it's positive or negative, right? Who remembers the little acronym for, for the graph here? ASTC, all students take calc calculus, all students take classes, whatever you prefer, right? So our angle is in the S area, and that means in that area that only sine is positive. Well, we're dealing with sine, so we're going to get a positive value. So this is, so this is incorrect. I'll draw another equal sign. This is equal to the sine inverse of square root of three root two. Okay. Now we need to figure out what the sine inverse of root three over two is. Okay. So remember, maybe we can come back to this to kind of help answer our question. If I'm if I'm asking what the sine inverse of root three over two is, this is the same question as sine of what angle gives me root three over two. And we just talked about this, right? What angle gives me root three over two for sine? That does give me root, that does give me root three over two for sine, but this value also has to be within the range. Pi over three. Pi over three. Good. So this is pi over three. Okay, so you have to be very careful. I can't just cancel them out. I, now, if it's again, like let's say this problem instead was was that it just had sine inverse of sine of pi over three. Well, that's inside the range, so I'm good to go. I'm done. Right. But if it's not, then I need to do a little bit more work. Okay. So it's something to bring your attention to. Just something to to think about. Um, for similar reasons, I said not. I guess not too much. It, this one's, I feel like this one's pretty intuitive. Um, sine of sine inverse of x is x, but only between negative one and one. Now this one, this one's not really one you have to worry about as much because I would hope you're not plugging in values below negative one and above one into sine inverse anyway, because you can't, there's no angle that goes with that, right? Sine doesn't, isn't in that range. So this one works in most cases, but this is the one you should be careful. Any questions on that thus far? Okay. Cool. So yeah, again here, this is just kind of talking about the inverse relationship, being careful here. And also, um, yeah, just kind of a little quick example of how to evaluate sine inverse, right? Or we'll get to cosine inverse and tangent inverse later as well, but that's it. Okay, let's do another example um, of kind of evaluating these inverse functions. And I have, let's see. We're going to do, so that was just a learning example, so I'll make a visual example of one now. Okay, so we want to figure out what the cosine, the arc sine of this is, right? So my question is just what is this? What is this number? Okay, so, um, you know, um, just like in the loss problem, we want to really be thinking about what our, what values we can take, what we're working with, right, um, in order to be able to answer this question, right? So let's talk about this point real quick. So if I have a sine, right, if I, if I have f of x equals sine x, right, I plug in, I would plug in an angle, right, into this function. And that's going to give me some sort of ratio out, right? That's what the trig functions are for. They tell you how different sides of the triangle are related together, right? So I put in an angle and I'm going to get a ratio out, right? Our inverse, right? sine inverse or arc sine, how do you prefer to write it? Okay. We are taking a ratio, right? Just some number, right? Uh, which is it's bigger than negative one, smaller than one. And we're changing it into an angle, right? So whenever I'm dealing with an inverse uh, trig function, I should be getting 
an angle whenever I evaluate it, right? So this arc sine of three fifths is what? What is this thing? Right, just based on that discussion. It's an angle, right? We have some ratio uh, of the triangle, and this is going to give us some angle, which I'll call theta. Okay. Now, if I have an angle, I can get the triangle from that, right? Because this is all dealing with the right triangle. So one of the angles is right here, and then we'll make this our theta angle. Right. Um, it, it is exactly. Um, we'll get to that here in a sec. Um, but you're absolutely right. <laughs> so, okay. So we build, we can build this triangle from this this trig function, right? And so this is the arc sine of three fifths, right? Remember this ratio sine sine in terms of the triangle is what? It's what side over what side? Opposite. Not over tangent. Okay. Hypotenuse. Thing. Okay. So it's opposite over hypotenuse. Well, that's exactly what this value tells us, right? So I'm going to take this three and I'm going to put this here and I'm going to take this five and I'm going to put this on my hypotenuse of the triangle, right? So knowing that this is an angle and having that ratio allows me to build my triangle out of it. It allows me to build a triangle that this inverse trig function expresses, right? Now, as already mentioned, this is actually going to be a three, four, five triangle. And if you weren't aware of that at first, we could figure it out by using, right? If I don't know this side of my right triangle, what theorem do I use? The Pythagorean theorem. Thank you. So, right, we have three squared plus, and I'll call this side B for now, B squared plus pi squared. Right? So, B squared is going to be 5 squared minus 3 squared, right, which is 25 minus 9, which is what? 16. Awesome. So it's going to be 16. So what's B? It's 4. Awesome. So B is going to be 4. So that is the last side of my triangle. Now, why is that important? I want to know what the cosine of this angle is, right? If I know this side, can I get the cosine of this triangle? Right? What is cosine in terms of a triangle? That side. Adjacent over hypotenuse, right? What's the adjacent side of this triangle? What's the hypotenuse of this triangle? Five. So this is going to be. Up here. Okay. So a little bit back, you know, doing some trick work again. Um, but this is just very important for us as we kind of move forward here uh, to really get a grasp of this function before we continue to work for a little bit. Okay, cool. Does that kind of make sense? Everybody getting that feel for this so far? Um, I think it's time for us to find the derivative of this thing. So let's do it. Okay. Um, So I want to find a derivative for this function. Seems like a bit of a task. Well, let's kind of work through it. So first, I'm going to write down my function, right? We have y equals the sine of the first x. OK. So I don't know how to take the derivative of this, but if I took off, if I ignore this negative one, would I be able to take the derivative of this? Yeah, exactly. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get sine in this problem. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to cancel out this sine inverse by applying sine to both sides, like this. Okay, we just saw, I just already just the um, as long as we're in the right domain for x, then these should pro properly cancel out, um, and they will. So we're going to get the sine of y. Right? Y hasn't changed. Um, 
we just rewrote the equation, but now we're in a form that, oh, I do know the derivative of these things now, right? So now let's take the derivative of both sides of this equation. What's the derivative of the left side going to be? The derivative of sine is cosine, but since it's y, we have to multiply by the derivative. <laughs> Okay, what's the derivative of x? One, thank you. So we're really left with this. Okay, so I want to get the derivative by itself. So I'm going to divide both sides by cosine of y, which is going to leave us with dy over dx equals one over cosine of y, um, which you could write that as secant, but I think I'm going to leave it right here for now. And I'll get to that in a second. Okay. Well, this doesn't seem to help very much. Um, I, I, great. I know the derivative is one over cosine um, y, um, but I would like it to be in terms of x, right? That's our ultimate goal is to get this in terms of x. Um, but the only thing I know about x is that x is equal to the time of y. Is there a way that I could rewrite cosine in terms of sine? Absolutely. So cosine of y is actually the same thing as the square root of 1 minus sine squared. Now, if you're unsure where that came from, let's think about this, right? Remember, we learned long ago, we have this in here, that if I take sine squared plus cosine squared, this gives me 1, right? So if I simply take this equation, I solve it for sine or cosine, we'll do cosine in this case, right? I get cosine squared y equals one minus sine squared y. Sides, I get cosine y equals the square root of y. So this is an accurate representation of cosine. Now, of course, our we have to be a bit particular on the domain exactly, but unfortunately for us, we don't have to worry about a plus or minus here. This is good to go. Um, just based on our um, our domain. Good. So. Now that we have this all figured out, I'm going to take my derivative and I'm going to rewrite it as 1 over the square root of 1 minus sine y. What is sine y? It's x. So the derivative. Okay, and I'll write it big right here. The derivative of sine. The derivative. Sine inverse of x equal to one over the square root of one minus x. There you go. Now this might be a little strange, a little bit surprising because you, you know, sometimes you expect that a sine in you know some sort of sine and cosine should be left over left with the normal trig functions, but in this case, it is not. We end up getting this this function instead um, as a representative of our derivative. Now um, this does have, again, um, a particular, I can't just plug whatever number I want into here, right? Um, I mean, of course, we already know that our domain for sine inverse is negative 1 to 1, but I have to even restrict it slightly further. And the reason I say that is because what happens if I plug 1 or negative 1 into this function? Yeah, well, it's yeah, it's like goes towards infinity. It's it's undefined right at those points, right? So this is true whenever negative one is less than x is less than one. Okay, I don't include those two. I can do anything between them. I just can't include them. Okay, so this is my okay. Does that make sense? Is that good? Well, let's um, we'll do an example of our derivative then. Um, the book in this part kind of covers a little bit of um, talking about a little more of the, applying the domain of sine inverse in this case, but uh, since it's really not the problem as much, I will uh, uh, so we'll just take the derivative of our function here. So what I make in this case. Okay. So I want to find the derivative of 
of the sine inverse of x cubed minus one. Okay. How do I do this? What rule do I need to use? Chain rule. Because yeah. we know the basic rule, but if there's something besides x on the inside, I have to use chain rule, right? So remind me, what's the derivative of sine inverse of x? Y. Square root. Yeah, and so it would be x squared in that case, but in our case, it's going to be x cubed one squared, just like that. Okay, remember to always keep that squared, right? Whatever's in here, it just replaces the x in this case. Perfectly. Okay, now you could actually expand that out. Some things will cancel, and you could do a little bit with it, but um, if you want to practice it more like an example, but we're just taking the derivative of the count. Am I done? No. What do I need to do? Yep, which is what? Fantastic. That's my derivative. Okay. Hopefully pretty straightforward at this point. Um, you're noticing probably um, by this by this late uh, semester uh, or by this far into calculus that our derivative is not focused as much on, oh let's take our little tiny. Baby steps, you know, let's make sure we're doing all the change. It's just like, you know, we won't do like a simple one and then do a chain rule. It, most examples are like this, right? You're not just going to have sign it for a Okay. Yep. So this is a sign inverse function. That's its derivative, and um, that's what we get. Okay. Awesome. Well, let's talk about another one. What inverse function do you, you want to talk about next? You want to talk about tangent next? I can do tangent next if you want me to. Is there, is there a vote? I can do cosine inverse or tan inverse next. Anybody? Cosine. Okay. Anybody else can vote? I might do cosine first because it does cosine. You know, because it does cosine first in general. Maybe that'll directly link. But I appreciate the feedback on, <laughs> on suggesting tangent. So, okay. Cosine. Looks like this, um, but again, I can't, I don't want to use the whole graph because that's going to give me problems when I find the inverse, right? So we need to cut this off a bit, okay? So here's the question, is, is can I, should I cut it off from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2? No. Why not? Yeah, that's, it's still not going to be 1 to 1 in that case, right? Because this is, this is negative pi over 2 and this is pi over 2, right? We're only getting the positive value. Right? And, I, and I, I even then, like even if I were only take this section, I really want to get the negative values as well. So what they typically do, right, well how we define it is I'm going to cut it off here and down here. Okay? So let's mark that off with that. So this is how we're going to define, we're going to leave cosine to find its inverse, because it's now one to one, right? And its inverse function, so let's be a little bit careful. We'll it'll look something along the lines of this sort of idea. A little bit more interesting when compared to its actual graph, but um, that's what we did there, okay? So this blue graph here, is the graph of cosine inverse of x, okay? Where the domain of this function is going to be, again, it's, it's the same domain as sine inverse. We want to take all the values. So it's gonna be negative one to one, right? Because cosine also goes from negative one to one. Um, the range in this case, though, is not negative pi over two to pi over two. 
it goes from zero. Okay, does that make sense at this point? Okay, good. So, as last time, right, we have our same sort of um, way to kind of translate between the two functions. Cosine inverse of x equals y implies that cosine of y is x. And we also have our cancellations. Cosine inverse of cosine x equals x. But just like with sine, this is only true for negative pi, or sorry, not negative pi, two. Zero is less than or equal to x, it's less than or equal to pi. Okay? If you have any, so you have, you can go a little bit closer to pi now um, in this case, but you only can see in this range. If it's not in this range, this isn't a true statement. Okay? We also have cosine. Cosine inverse. So this is for negative one plus so equal to x. Okay, so there's more useful information for cosine inverse. And then we have its derivative. Which we can find in the extremely similar way to the to how we did sine. Um, and it's gonna look very similar to sines, actually. Same thing, except for one slight difference. Okay, so if you're dealing with sine inverse, its derivative is positive one over one squared one minus x squared. If it's cosine inverse, you write down the same thing, but you put a negative sign instead. Okay, so something to be careful with. Okay, um, you can feel free to work that out if you want. Um, it's a nurse, the section where, oh no, that's okay. That's too nearly a secret or Okay, what we're left with. Now let's move on to, okay, we can finally get the tangent. Because that cosine differs pretty easily. Now tangent obviously is going to take a little bit more um, effort, right? Um, because it's not just the same sort of shape. We're just slightly moved over. Um, we're dealing with a different sort of function altogether. So, the graph of tangent looks like Something like this, um, which would be going the same sort of thing over this way. But it looks kind of like this. Okay? Is this function one to one? Absolutely not. Um, because if you test a horizontal line test, it fails. Um, so we're going to cut this down. Um, but luckily for us, cutting this one down is actually going to be a bit easier, right? Um, because really, I just have a whole bunch of this one little curve, right? So I'm just going to take one for myself and leave all the other ones behind. And the easiest one to take is this one that just so happens to be in between negative pi over two and pi over two, just like sine was, right? So we're going to ignore all the rest of these. Just take. And if we were to find graph the inverse function, we are going to get something that actually looks like, let's see, this. We have to kind of take those asymptotes. So this blue graph here is our graph of tan inverse of x. Okay. So here's the question for us, right? And maybe um, with that one, I didn't put the time on, but let's talk about tan real fast. Okay. What is the domain of, of tan x? And 
at least maybe we'll restrict it to our graph here. What is the domain of tan tangent in this case? What two values is it between? Do I include those? They're they're undefined, right? Tangent is undefined at those points because cosine is zero and tangent sine for cosine. So I need to keep these points. Okay. What is the range of tangent? Negative infinity to infinity. We also don't include those, but. This one actually is all real numbers. This one's not restricted between negative one and one. This is this is all by numbers, right? So now let's talk about tan numbers. What is the domain of tan numbers of x? Yeah, all real numbers, negative infinity, infinity. Fantastic. What's the range? Awesome. So that is my tan inverse function. That's its domain of range. Okay. So the range is very similar to sine inverse, right? But of course, since we have a lot more, a lot bigger domain, um, we can do a bit more with this. There's a lot more going on. Um, as last time, we have our same um, sort of rules um, with that. If tan inverse. That's the same thing as saying uh, tangent of y. Okay, so that's useful. Maybe solve this equations at times. Um, we're going to have tangent inverse of tangent x equals x. Okay. Now, um, this one has to be for x that's in between negative 5 or 2. For the same reasons as before, we obviously if I tangent of uh, like pi exists, right, which is going to be zero, but that's not that's not going to translate in the same first relations. Okay, so make sure if you're working with something like this, it does, it's only true for negative pi or two pi. Tangent and inverse of x, however, this is actually equal to x. And this is for all x. So this is this one's not restricted at all. That means that I can put whatever x I want in there and it's a true statement, which is fantastic. Okay, so there's a little bit of restriction restriction on this relationship, but this one's pretty nice actually. So keep track of Okay. Good. So um, before we talk about the derivative of this function. Um, we're going to talk about another example um, because earlier we just used sine inverse and uh, we used that, but now let's try to apply tan inverse and maybe cosine as well together in one problem. So let's do number two. Okay, so the book has one. Obviously, I like to try to flip that up a little bit. So we're gonna figure out what tan inverse of cosine of three x is gonna be. So this one, this one's a little bit more. In the last example, we just had a number that we plugged in um, to be able to get just a number out of it, right? But what this allows us to do actually is it allows us to kind of get a range of x values, right? I can say, okay, if I plug x, if I plug this x to this function, I get this number out of it. So it gives me a lot more versatility instead of just one concrete answer, right? Which is kind of the idea of mathematics as a whole, right? The only reason things get harder is we're trying to make things more general, right? I don't want to just do 50,000 different problems. I want to do one problem to be able to plug all those 50,000 examples into, right? Save my time. <laughs> so we're going to figure out this problem, right? And the way we're going to do this, right? Uh, oh, wait. Oh, sorry. I made a mistake earlier. There we go. That'll be a little bit easier, huh? Tan and tangent of cosine inverse of 3x. Let's try that one out instead. Because this will be very similar to the other problem. My apologies. Okay. So, speaking of the other one, 
How should I start this problem out? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Is sine inverse over cosine inverse? No, that is not correct in this case, unfortunately. Um, yeah, sine over cosine is tangent, sine inverse over cosine inverse is not tangent inverse, right? And we'd be able to see that as well, even remember the domain of tan inverse is negative infinity to infinity, right? Sine inverse and cosine inverse, it only has a range of, these both only have a range of negative one to one. So there's a, even a translation of domain that doesn't, that won't work there. Okay. How should I start this one? Yeah, so we're gonna have a triangle. Which it doesn't matter how you draw it. It doesn't matter how to do the scale, I'm just sure you have the general idea. So we're gonna draw a right triangle because this is gonna this is related to some sort of right triangle. Right? Okay. So I have this right triangle um, with some specific angle. What is this angle? What is it? Good. It says it's. Well, so. This is my thing, right? Cosine inverse of three x is my is my theta, right? So what does that tell me about my angle? Right? Can I can I infer something or figure out something about the sides based on knowing that that's the angle? So I'm going to label the bottom side of this triangle 3x, and I'll label this side 1. Now the reason I'm doing that is because, just for some who like are unsure, um, is that cosine, right? Remember, this is the cosine, right? Theta is cosine inverse of 3x, right? But what this, what we also know, right, using our kind of our inverse relationships, is this is the same thing as saying that the cosine of my angle is equal to three x, right? And we know cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse, right? So this three x is represents my adjacent over, over hypotenuse. Now the easiest way to kind of fit it to the triangle is since it's only like three x, we can just put it over one. And then from there, I put 3x on the base, which is the adjacent side of the angle, and we put 1 on the hypotenuse. Okay? So, again, very similar to the other problem. Um, there's this, you know, new idea of like, oh, I'm going to worry about the over 1 part. Um, but now we're just working with x instead of some other. Okay? I want to find tangent, right? What is tangent in terms of a triangle? Here. So, we need the opposite side. How do I find the opposite side? Okay. So help me set up my uh, Pythagorean theorem. What's it going to look like? Yeah, cube of b squared. Um, if you want to put a over, that's fine. Uh, it doesn't matter. So I'm sure you understand. So you put 3x on this side and 1 on that side. Okay. So we can solve this. We're going to get b squared equals 1 because 1 squared is 1. And then 3x squared is going to be 9x squared. Okay, so then b is just the square root of that, which is 1 minus 9x squared. Okay, so what's the tangent of that angle? Okay, so that's the answer. Again, very similar to the other one. Uh, we just wanted to bring tangent and cosine to this to do a little bit more work. Okay. Good. So, uh, they say there. So let's go ahead and do one last thing. Uh, talk about one one last kind of feature of tangent inverse before we do the derivative, um, which is going to be. The limits of tangent because whenever we were doing sine inverse and cosine inverse, we didn't really have to worry about this because we had every value in our domain. Um, but 
we want to establish something for sure. It's just when it comes to tan inverse, so we can know that um, kind of what happens as we go to the extreme left and right of this graph. So the limit has x approaches negative infinity of tan inverse and the limit and x approaches infinity and inverse of x is going to be positive. Okay. So you can see this from the picture. Um, it's very just be helpful to write it down and think about it. Um, but yeah, so as I go to the extreme right of the graph, I'm going to be approaching pi over two, right? Which means, and, and I especially shouldn't be going over that, right? So my graph should move closer and closer to that line, but it should never touch that line. And as I go to the extreme left hand side, I should be getting closer and closer to negative pi over two, but I should never touch it, right? This is one of those details that kind of separates it from a graph like x cubed, right? Because with x cubed, right, maybe I'll use it for color. Um, the graph of x cubed looks kind of similar to tangent, but it, it can just keep going. It doesn't have any asymptotes, so it can keep going to the left and to the right, it doesn't stop, right? So recognizing these limit points, recognizing these asymptotes is going to help us just to differentiate them and help us to plot them correctly. And and to evaluate them and to know what values we can plug in or we can't plug in. Um, that's actually a great question. Um, I've kind of thought about that myself. I think it's funny that they do look so similar. Um, I think it's just a coincidence, honestly, um, in the end of it. Um, but it is fun, like, especially if you're just having on a smaller scale, you're like, oh, they, they, they're doing the same thing. That's so funny. Um, so maybe I'll get back to that. <laughs> okay, yeah. So let's. Who wants to prove? Not not you. Definitely can. I'll, I'll do it. Obviously, I'm not gonna ask someone else to uh, prove the derivative of tan inverse. Um, but it is not as maybe easy to get as cosine inverse is. So let's walk through it. Okay. So the function of life is tan inverse of x. Right. Now again, from last time, we're gonna do something similar to where we're gonna take the tangent of both sides. Okay, so we're gonna get the tangent of y. Okay. Now we want to get the derivative, so we're gonna take the derivative of the left side and the right side. What is the derivative of tan tangent of y? x, which is 1. So dy over dx is going to be 1 over c against y. We're in a similar predicament, so I don't I don't know how secant's related to x, but I do know how tangent's related to x. So is there some way I can rewrite secant in terms of tangent? Secant squared, actually, especially in this case. Anybody remember? Plus x squared plus. Yes, so uh, I, I feel like there's a lot uh, I heard a lot around the room, but yes. So secant squared is the same thing as one plus tangent squared. Okay. This and this are the same thing. Um, and you should probably remember that identity from um, trig, just working with it, but in case you're unsure of how we get to that, if you trust in this and you know this to be true, just take both sides and divided by sine squared because we get sine squared divided by sine squared is one. Oops, wait, not sine squared, cosine squared, wait a minute. Okay, sine squared divided by cosine squared is going to be tangent. Cosine squared divided by cosine squared is one, and one over cosine squared is C. So that's where we get that identity as well. Uh, still in line with like the Pythagorean identity. The right triangle. Uh, get this. Okay, so this is the same thing as one over one plus tangent squared y. So what is tangent? X. So we get one over one plus. Yeah. So the derivative of tangent is one over one plus. Okay, 
So no square root this time. It's just one over one plus x squared. Okay. Um, so at this point, um, we're just going to do some more examples of just like you know, practicing some derivatives and, and working with them. Um, I'm going to, before we just kind of get into that, though, I'm going to finish off by giving you a little table of all of our inverse terms because we want to cover in depth um, sine, cosine, and tangent inverse, but the other functions also have. Um, you know, particular, um, you know, derivatives. And so we'll want to kind of have all those together just in case a problem like that pops up. Um, I won't bother too much writing down the domains of those because they're not even really agreed upon in general. Um, some people like have a certain way to write it, but uh, okay. So let's just go ahead and write all these down. So in including here, the derivative of sine inverse of x is 1 over 1 minus x squared. The derivative of cosine inverse of x is negative 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared. The derivative of tan inverse of x is 1 over 1 plus x squared. These are the ones that we've done. Um, the derivative of cosecant inverse of x is going to be 1 over negative 1 over x the square root of x squared minus 1. The derivative of secant inverse of x is going to be 1 over x times the square root of x squared minus 1. And the derivative of cotangent inverse of x is going to be uh, pretty sure it's just, yeah, negative 1 over 1. Uh, okay. So those are all for us. Um, you notice that really you only have to memorize three and the other three with it are have negative signs on it, but um, that's where we're looking. Okay, so let's do a couple of examples. Um, let's see, the example number four. A couple of terms here. So let's do the derivative of x times the cosine inverse of x. What is the derivative of x times the cosine inverse of x? How do we start it? Not chain rule. We don't need really need to use chain. product rule. Good. Yes. So we're going to use product rule, right? So this is going to be my f and this is going to be my g. So let's start off with we'll do the derivative of f first. What is the derivative of x? One. And that's going to be times cosine inverse plus f, which is x, what's the derivative of g? Okay. So, okay. We're going to do a square root of the arc tangent, which is, again, just the inverse tangent. Okay. okay. How do I start the derivative of this one? You write the whole thing to the power of one half. Yeah, that's, that sounds like a great idea. So, oh yeah, let me. Uh, okay, so I'm going to write this as arcan um, e to the x. All right, so we're going to be using we're going to be using chain rule, right? So to start this chain off, those we're working down, right? What is the first step? One half. Yeah, it's it's the one half, right? It's the exponent. So this is going to be one half times. R can e to the x. Good. R can e to the x. Negative one half. Okay. Times. Awesome. Yep. Okay. 
Yep. Awesome. So let's let's walk through that again, right? So we started, we're going from the outside in. Okay. So the first step is, oh, everything's to the one half power. So I'm gonna use general power rule, which says I'm gonna have one half times r tan e to the x raised to the negative one half power. That part's done. And then I move to the next step, which is I move one step inside, which is r tangent. The derivative of r tangent is one over one plus x squared. We have e to the x in there, so I replace e to the x um, for the x. So I get one over one plus e to the x squared. Finally, I move that last step inside the e to the x, and I multiply by the derivative, which is going to be e to the x, right? So essentially, here's like first step, here's second step, right? Right. So we just kind of work our way down, okay? A little more complicated, but like a chain rule, right? If you have a few steps rather than just one or two. Um, well, it usually is two, but uh, still the same idea. Okay. So really, what we're seeing here is that we're just going to take these derivatives and kind of lump them in with what we've already been doing, like with derivatives. We just have some more things to derive. How excited! Okay. Now we're not quite done yet here. Um, which is okay because actually, um, in the next section isn't too long. Uh, doesn't have too many examples. So, I'm here and we're going to um, do some integral. Now, uh, I will mention um, if you're interested, there's a the book shows just as a fun fact that um, using calculus that tan inverse of x plus. No matter what x is, is the true statement. And you can use calculus to show this, which is kind of fun. Um, I'm not going to cover the proof of that. If you're curious, if you want to look at it yourself, that's kind of cool. Okay. So, integrals. Um, again, we're not at a place where we can just integrate these functions as R, because um, we're going to need more tools for that. Um, which will actually, actually, you'll have the tools for that um, right after the test on Tuesday, because we don't have class Monday. Um, but um, we can go ahead and do these ones at least. So the book gives two. They're fairly intuitive, just coming from the definitions, the derivatives over here. I'm just working backwards, but it might still be useful. So, we have the integral of 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared dx equals sine inverse of x plus c. Right, so if you have the integral in that form, and it's going to be sine inverse of x plus c. And then if you have 1 over 1 plus x squared dx or something like that, um, if it's used instead, which will probably will be in some cases, um, we're going to get tan inverse of x plus c. Okay, and so this is, um, these are my standard, uh, standard ones that I use. Um, it doesn't happen very often that you use ones with, with seeking in it. Um, so I, I might add that on just so you can have it just in case you run across a problem like that. But I will tell you right now that you do not need the other three functions for this, for the integrals, okay? And the reason being, Right? If, if this was right, I mean, cosine inverse, right, is just negative one over the square root of one minus x squared. So I don't need to remember two cases and be like, oh, well, it's a negative now, so it'll be cosine inverse. I could just as easily bring this negative sign outside and then just integrate it as sine inverse instead. So try to make your life easier, don't make your life more difficult, right? So we can always do this. Okay. Yes, would you accept both, like if I could do cosine as two correct answers? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so uh, that would be fine. Yeah, um, yeah. I'm not. I'm not complaining. Like if you do write that, that's completely that's completely fine. So if you had a negative and you're like, oh, well, that's that's cosine inverse, then that's okay. Um, but for the most part, though, it's just easier to stick with the one and just kind of roll it from there. Um, but I, I I won't be upset. I promise. <laughs> okay, let's do example number. Going to be a couple integrals. Okay. What did I write this time? Let's see. So we have integral of 1 over the square root of 
1 minus 16x squared. Okay. Do I know the answer? Can we just do it? I'm going to need to use substitution. Okay, yes, because I have 16x squared instead of x squared. However, and this doesn't have to be a perfect square, but I can always I can always think about this instead of a number times x squared as 1 minus 4x. So, yes, I'm going to take this and I want to use a u sub to be able to do this integral. Okay? Because I would rather this be in this form so I know what to do rather than trying to get some, oh, well, maybe there's just some four kind of moving around somewhere. I don't know. Let's just see where it goes. Um, let's, let's do a u sub to make this tighter. Okay? So, what is u going to be? Is it 16x squared? Is that 4x squared? 4x. It's going to be 4x. Okay? Now we're gonna pick 4x because we want we want to keep that squared there, right? Because we want that we want to be able to translate it. Okay, so I don't take the whole thing squared, or I just take the x squared. I want to take whatever is inside the square, which is 4x. Okay, and that's specifically because I recognize it as it looks like our inverse. Okay, what's du? Um, so again, there's numerous ways to do this. Uh, I'm, I just want to get match what's in here, which is only dx right now. So I'm going to divide both sides of this by 4, which gives me dx is du over 4. So then this integral is going to become the integral of 1 over the square root of 1 minus u squared times du over 4, which maybe I'll go ahead. If I have du over 4, that 1 fourth can just come to the front. What's the integral of 1 over the square root of 1 minus 2 squared? Get the sine inverse of u of t. And what's u? All right, thank you. So that'll be a second. Let's do one last integral here because we want to practice on the tangent at least, right? And then we'll take a break. So we have the integral. From zero to two of one over four x squared plus sixteen. Maybe it helps out. I'm gonna rewrite. Uh, okay. So this is a little more complicated, right? Because I don't, I can't really just do a simple u sub here. Right? Not only is it with the x squared, but it's also with, there's also something in place of the 1, right? It's 16 now. So, I have to figure out something to do with that 16 to get, to get 1, right? So that's my first goal. I want to have 1 here. So I need to do something with the 16 to get 1 there. That's what Factor out, okay. So if I factor out a 4, that would get rid of this 4, but this would just make this 4. So I don't just factor out a 4, I need to factor out something bigger. 16. So if I factor 16 out of this 4x squared, I'm left with x squared over 4. Right? Because what's going to happen is, is Right, I just divide 16 from both terms, or divide by 16 and multiply. So I can this Okay, good. So I want to factor out that 16, so I have a plus one now. Fantastic. We're on the right track. I still don't have quite what I want though, because I don't have x squared, I have x squared over four. So what is my next uh, course of action here? 
Use a okay. Uh, what am I use up? X over two. I'm gonna use sub x over two because right. Um, I'm gonna write this just right below, so I don't have to write another line like this. But x squared over four is the same thing as x over two squared. So I'm gonna let you x over two, and I'm gonna let me I'll just get the d over the one half. Okay, which isn't quite what I want. Um, I went ahead and put this one sixteenth out, and I'm not going to worry about um, exactly getting the numbers all together. So I'm just going to go ahead and multiply both sides of this by two. So I get two du x, and then I plug this in. So what am I going to be left with once I plug all this, all that stuff in? Yeah, one, two, plus one D, right? And then we have a two here. Top right here, we have one eight. One eight. Okay. Yep. So we're going to get one. We have one sixteenth times two, which is going to be one eight. Okay. Um, maybe we'll go ahead and take the liberty here and just go ahead and change the bounds as well. Um, so my original bounds were zero and two. So what are my new bounds going to be? Zero. Zero. Yep. Because we do zero divided by two, and one because we do two divided by two. Is everyone able to kind of follow a little bit what's going on? Um, really, your goal in these problems is I need to make this look like that. Because once you make it look like that, then it's easy, right? So you might just have to manipulate some numbers around. Um, you know, the book might give you a hint sometimes occasionally just have to do it. But yeah, why did one sixteen put a one? Because you have one sixteen here, and then we put in two du for dx. So you have one sixteenth times two, which gives you one. Yep. I thought because it started with zero. What is it? I thought when you brought it up to the front, you took it out. Yeah. Right. Wouldn't it be exact one sixteenth? Not well. It it was this. This didn't have anything to do with the use of right. But even though, when it comes to constants, I can always take those in or out of the integral. They don't change anything, right? If now, if there was like a two in here, right, with the, the one half in here with the dx, right, I could take that all together with the du. But really, with constants, I can be a little bit more. Oh, okay. it's, it's two over 16. Yes, it's two over 16. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If that makes sense now. Yep. So, yeah, essentially, we have one sixteen, but then it was multiplied by two, so you get two over 16, which is one. Okay, so that's what I came from. Okay. Um, Okay, so what is this integral going to become? Yep, and then plus C. But since it's a definite integral, we don't have to worry about the plus C. We just evaluate this from our bound, which if you plug, you would some sometimes you might plug in X first and then do it. But here we're just going to plug in our numbers. Okay, so what is tan inverse at zero? It's going to be zero, right? And if you're if you're unsure, if you said, "Oh wait, I'm not I'm not quite sure what that is," right? This is the same thing as saying this is the same question as tangent of what angle gives me zero, right? And it has to be within the negative pi over two to pi over two range, and so your only option is zero. Okay, so that's just going to give me zero when I plug in zero. What is tangent inverse of one? Yes. So again. Tangent to one, same question as tangent theta. What angle makes tangent equal to one, which is going to be pi over four, um, which is because sine and cosine of pi over four are the same number, so they just cancel each other. Okay, so it might be good to review those numbers. Um, I would really like, you know, spend some time on it. Remember what your angles go to. Um, I really don't have as much time to do that in this class, um, but we're going to get one eighth times pi over four, which is pi. Over Cool. Well, hope I didn't bore you too much with some inverse trig functions. Um, when we come back in a bit, um, after 10 minutes, we're going to do some hyperbolic functions, and that's going to wrap up chapter six for us. So, oh, yeah.
Could you not have taken 16x squared and put it directly into sine negative one? So it would have been sine negative one of 16x squared, then you should have used chain rule on that. Well, remember we don't we don't really have a chain rule when it comes to integrals. We have chain rule when it comes to derivatives. Oh, okay. We have u substitution when it comes to that. But also I don't put notice uh, so the formula is the integral of the sequel sine inverse. It's not x squared that goes in here, right? It's x that goes in there. Okay. So we need to be careful about that. Okay. Okay. Any other questions?